Welcome to the Half Percent Podcast. My name is Nick Plosser, and I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, this is episode two, but before we get into that, I want to encourage everybody to make us a part of your feeds. Hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to podcasts. Uh, Google Play, Apple iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, uh, all of the above. We're available on their YouTube. Um, so I want to encourage you to please make us a part of your feed. Share the show, spread the word, so on. Uh, today's guest uh, I'm really excited to talk to is Brian Anderson. Uh, Brian and I have known each other for 30 plus years, grew up together, going all the way back to Little League. So, um, and when I started this podcast, Brian was really helpful, uh, picked his brain a little bit. And he introduced me to some people. So, B, thank you very much. And um, it's really good, to t- really good to finally sit down and do this. Um, Brian is a newly retired officer in the, in the uh, Army, where he spent the last 20 plus years. He was started out in the medical field and finished his career in logistics. Uh, and in the, in between time, he's been all over the place, all over the world. So um, it's a fun conversation. Good to catch up with him. And uh, let's get to the show. Okay, Mr. Push-Ups, let's hear your story. It's not just the uniform. It's the stories that you tell. So much fun and an imagination. From now on, you will speak only when spoken to. And the first and last words out of your filthy sewers will be sir. Do you maggots understand that? We are ready to roll, man. Um, really excited to do this. I'm here with uh, Brian Anderson, man. Old, 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 old friend. BA, what's up? Not much, man. How's it going? It's going, it's going, it's going. Excited to, thanks for uh, for agreeing to do this, man. And also thanks for, you know, putting me in touch with some other people that that are in your business, man. So I, I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, man, it's my pleasure, man. You know, I, I know this is something we've been kind of talking about for, uh, you know, a little while now. And I'm uh, really, really glad to help. Yep. No, no doubt, man. I think it's a, hopefully a good project and, and to give, uh, you know, a little wider audience or the people that don't, uh, don't choose a career in the military kind of more of an idea of what you know what you guys do and all the white all the different jobs you guys do and things like that so let's just dive right in man um you know uh, full disclosure brian and i have known each other for i was trying to think back elementary school Uh, middle school uh, brother i think it's been maybe uh parts of little league and then school i was thinking about that just the other day i want to say probably one of the first uh, non-Caroline Wenzel people I met at, uh, <laughs> right. at junior high school, man. So, so yeah, yeah we definitely go back to some youngins. I was, I was, I was saying, because I think the first time I met you was probably in Little League, too. So that's got to be 10, 11, something like that. So Oh, gosh. So yeah, anyway, man. so anyway, uh, far too long, man. So, um, yeah, just full disclosure, Brian, when I was thinking about starting this whole podcast and doing this project, I contacted Brian because I knew he had, had you know, chosen a career in the military and um so yeah there we are man so we've been friends for a long time so um but uh you know I, i'll just start this out by saying because part you know the whole p- purpose of this is to get to know people man and to kind of know the person behind a, who chooses this career man and so um i've known you for a long time and i and i will say that you always march to the beat of your own drummer so um and and I, that that was evident early on man and that's probably one of the reasons why i was uh, why i wanted to hang out with you but uh um, so dig right in, give me a quick bio, uh, for those that are listening that don't know kind of who you are, where you're from, your family, and then we'll get into it. Okay. Okay. Well, at, you know, certainly man, Brian Anderson, man, uh, you know, uh, great, beautiful green Haven of, uh, of, of South Sacramento. Um, you know, I'm a, a son of a bus driver and a banker. I, you know, definitely come from a, a very working class, middle-class background, a uh, good, solid family. Uh, great, you know, I've been blessed with great friends, uh, and some great opportunities. Uh, you know how it goes going back all the way to, you know, the old, uh, South Sac Greenhaven pocket days, man. Yep. That's right. You know, certainly very quiet, uh, pretty normal, a lot of sports, you know, uh, a lot of kids of similar age too, man. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, a lot of us running around dude, for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Some great opportunities there, man. Uh, you know, just like I said, there's pretty, pretty normal and mundane childhood. Nothing, you know, nothing super out of the ordinary. Um, yeah, nothing really big there. Uh, 
you know, like you said, just kind of marched to the beat of my own drum, kind of growing up, always been really active, you know, really always trying to get into some things and trying new things out. It was always, you know, very adventurous uh, and, and things of that nature. Cool, cool. Now, is there, now, do you have any, so what was the first inclination uh, of, of trying to join the service? Like you, I, you know, you mentioned, we've talked off air, but um, like you, you mentioned a few different things, uh, you know, you wanting to get out of sack, you wanting to, what, what were, what was kind of the, uh, and then also I keyed on something you, uh, you, you like me read a lot of Hemingway growing up. So I, I keyed on that. Talk about that, man. Okay. Uh, so, you know, actually man, getting in the military was a, uh, it was kind of a multi-headed thing. Uh, you know, I, like most kids, you grow up, we either want to be a soldier or a firefighter or a policeman or something like that. Um, so, you know, I kind of went through that phase early, uh, had looked into the uh, the aviation program, uh, but I was <laughs> really undisciplined. In right, high. right, right. So that kind of closed off that option uh, going initially afterward. Um, but, you know, like I said, I've always had a lot of energy, man, you know, huge imagination. I'm a big, big Ernest Hemingway fan and uh you know, growing up reading his books and his, you know, his travels, you know, all the way through Europe, uh, his, you know, his time as an expatriate working in the Spanish Civil War, yeah. uh, things of that, you know, certainly seems so much, uh, so, so much of a different life than what was going to be waiting for me if I stayed in SAC, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, then, you know, life happens. Uh, you kind of move on from certain things or whatever else. And I, you know, I kind of started bagging groceries for a while and, uh, yeah, you were. I, where was that? I, I remember that too. Where were you at? I was at uh, Bel Air, man. Bel Air, that's right. That's right. Rush River, yep. man. So I, I never, you know, you know how it goes, man. You never really leave the neighborhood too much. No question. Okay, never really, really, never really leave the neighborhood. So that was always a that was a thing. But you know, it was, it was good. You know, close to my friends and everything else like that. Yep. You know, Nineteen had a chance to you know kind of be out, uh, moved out. Uh, just kind of had a had a great time downtown uh, with some of our uh, some Lamb Park friends that we share in common. Yep. And uh, you know, getting into some low some low key like like lightweight hooliganism, <laughs> uh, <laughs> trouble making. You know, it was a lot of fights every night, parties every night. You know, a lot of stuff like that. It was good, um, fun. Uh, certainly a lot different than what my uh, life was growing up in the burbs, but uh, you know. Uh, Next thing I know, let's call it what it is. Next thing I know, my my wife, then girlfriend, uh, came to me and said that she was pregnant. Well, at the same time she said that, a lot of my friends started going to jail, and it didn't seem like that was a, a great way to raise a kid, being in and out of jail or you know getting nicked for lightweight stuff. So I uh, I went down to the recruiter on uh, How and uh, was it How and Hurley? How and Hurley. Yep. Yeah, I walked into Howland Hurley, told the guy, I was like, hey, man, I'm ready to join the Army. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, guy looks at me crazy. I mean, I mean, my hair's all over the place, man. I think I was probably going dreadlocks at the time. Uh, you know, he comes in, asks me a couple of questions and uh, sit down. He's like, are you ready? And I was like, yep. So he's like, what do you want to do? I said, I don't care. I just want to get out of Sacramento, man. And uh, next thing I know, we're uh, me and a friend of mine, um, uh, we decided to try to do a little buddy thing, so we uh, shot down to uh, Oakland, because that's where the nearest MEPS was at the time, Oakland, California, downtown, and uh, went right in, took the test, scored really well, and it just opened up a wealth of opportunity to me, man. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so it was, uh, so because you know Kennedy, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, where where Brian went to high school, does have a they had a, have an ROTC program there, right? Yes, they did. And, uh, interesting that you brought that up. I was actually in the ROTC program. I was gonna say, did you? Yeah, were you involved in that? Because and then, it, yeah, definitely, man. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, yeah, no, 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 no. And, and good point. I, you know, I, I plum forgot all about that. Yeah, man, it was. Uh, I was actually in the ROTC program. That was not a uh, a great driver for me to be in. However, right, I, I learned a lot. Uh, certainly, one of my earliest mentors, uh, Sergeant Major Al McClymans. I'm gonna name drop a little bit on the do it, man. Do it. Days. Uh, but uh, Sergeant Major Al McClymans, uh retired, a uh, fantastic, fantastic uh, senior non-commissioned officer, retired U.S. Marine. Uh, learned a lot from him. Uh, Major Benjamin, uh, another guy I learned a lot from. Uh, interestingly enough, as I would kind of got on in my career, I actually found myself <laughs> adopting some Major Benjaminisms. But that's a story for a little bit later on in this in this discussion. As, as we all do, bro. As we all do. <laughs> You know, and uh, but yeah, so certainly learned a lot there. Made a lot of good lifelong friends. Uh, 
you know, stuff like that. But yeah, like I said, in and of itself was not a key driver in me joining the military. Okay. Okay. So just, just like, I, and, and, you know, talking to a lot of people, man, it seems it's always kind of multifactorial, man. The, the reasons that someone chooses to go, that was certainly, you know, certainly a mix of one of the reasons I wanted to try to join as well. So I just, you know, always curious to get someone's motivation, man. And, um, so you, so, okay. So you, you, uh, you take maps again, you pass everything. Uh, where's your first stop for the army? So first stop was uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, man. It happened to be during one of the coldest winters on record, man. Nice. Of course it did. 1996, man. And uh, so I'm dating myself now. It's, you know, it's nothing like looking at a bunch of dates before you start realizing how old you've gotten all of a sudden. <laughs> Happens quick, dude. Happens quick. Uh, but yeah, it's Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, great, you know, uh, it was a very interesting first experience. Certainly uh, one of my big first experiences away from home, certainly away from my parents, uh, away from friends and family uh, for an extended period of time. Uh, certainly my big, uh, my first trip out of the enormous fishbowl that uh, Sacramento is. No doubt, no doubt. <laughs> um, you know, interesting, you know, it's very, uh, very interesting uh, experience, though. Uh, I, even after all these years, I remember so many pieces of it, you know, I've, had made some friendships that I've still, you know, have maintained some 25, you know, 25 ish years later. And so you, uh, so what were your kind of your, you mentioned that that was a, a mixed sex, you know, uh, basic training, the men and women, what, like, what were some of your initial, you know, coming into, because obviously you're thrown in there with, with, uh, enlisted guys all over the, all over the country, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So it was uh, really interesting. So, yeah, like uh, we had discussed kind of offline, it was uh, mixed gender. So, you know, the Army certainly has changed over the years. Um, you know, this was one of the very first uh, or I should say one of the earliest iterations of mixed gender basic training. Uh, so at this time, there were still uh, multiple posts that were doing, um, you know, single gender training uh, and things of that nature. Uh, however, Fort Leonard was, was mixed gender. So, uh, that in itself was was good and interesting. Um, you know, I obviously growing up, you know how it goes, man. Like I, I never really cared one way or the other, so it wasn't that big of a deal to me. I mean, Cal right. California in that regard is, you know, has generally been pretty uh, <laughs> progressive. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> um, so, uh, but you know, in that regard, it was nothing really uh, out of out of line there. Uh, what I did learn, however, um, was you know, kind of just seeing the. Uh, Differences in the manner and behavior of uh, not just men and women, but people just from all over the country. Uh, you know, really some of my first times meeting, you know, I just call it what it is, you know, meeting other people besides, you know, blacks, whites and Mexicans and Asians that we, you know, that we grew up around. And blacks, whites, educa that grow up in our specific fishbowl. You know what I mean? Like exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's, that's definitely. You, you, and you mentioned, you know, you mentioned uh, good times in the eight man bay and you got, you got three white dudes, four black dudes, <laughs> and Cuban, man. so you know what I mean? Like that's, uh, you know, that's always interesting to get thrown into that. And I think overall uh, good for you. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah. Most definitely, man. So, you know, and, and the great things about, you know, situations like that is, Something like this, you know, puts a bunch of strangers in a very closed environment, that, and it's almost like a pressure cooker, man. I mean, it's fatigue, it's energy, it's it's let's call it what it is. It's testosterone. It's yeah, a, no doubt. Everybody kind of all together, and I'll tell you what it does. It makes fast friends. Um, yep. So you know, I talked about the three white guys, four black guys, and the one Cuban uh, that were in the bay. Uh, all great dudes, um, all from different spots of the world. I had. Uh, one of my oldest buddies, uh, Abraham, uh, is from St. Louis. Uh, I got a guy, uh, Cannon, man. This guy came from uh, Union City, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, I met a dude, I can't remember his name offhand, uh, came from, uh, you know, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I've got guys, a, a black dude from Idaho, man. I yeah, you said you, 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 you just figured out there were brothers in, uh, in Idaho, right? Yeah, man. So he was like, the, I didn't even know that was a thing, man. And uh, Kenny Blair, man, good dude, real good dude, um, real funny. Uh, I, I will tell you uh, a, a quick story about Kenny, man. We were sitting in uh, one of the earliest days, you know, like uh, we're sitting in like one of the larger bays as the entire platoon. And, you know, the drill sergeants have us out kind of talking, doing a quick interview, uh, quick discussion about who you are and all this other stuff. So we get to Kenny. <laughs> His biggest story was getting bit by a horse. Oh, damn. Okay. Yeah, man. So he's like, <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt to do this guy's voice, 
But yeah, he goes around and, you know, he's like, yeah, he's like, my one, I don't know, claim to fame is I got bitten in the neck by a horse. <laughs> it gets quiet. Er, because you couldn't talk anyway. So if I gets quieter, no, but you could tell the mood in the room shift, man. Oh yeah, and like every single eye turns to this guy, and the drill sergeant's like, "Boy, how in the hell did you get hit by? How the hell did you get bit by a horse?" And starts laughing, and so I guess everybody else kind of took that as a cue to start laughing as well. But we were wrong because we ended up doing push-ups after that. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's just one of those things. But you know, good uh, good guys. Um, you know, good guys all. I think after uh, – oh, and then uh, uh, another one of my guys, uh, Russell Brass, uh, who we still keep in contact to this day. He, uh, he's up in, uh, up in Dallas now. And, uh, you know, like I said, man, just just great stories. Uh, you know, great well, yeah. a bunch of fellas. I think – yeah, I think just to interject, man, I think that what, what the military seems to do very well and I think probably better than any other institution in, in American life, which is just to throw – you know, my, just a real quick, my stepdad was in World War II in the Navy, um, and that was what he said. You know, he got thrown in, uh, you know, his, his little uh, – his first, you know, basic training was – you know, he had Jewish guys from New York. He had black guys from the South. He had, uh, you know, uh, uh, Scandinavian guys from the Midwest. He had – uh, you know, you know, Hispanic guys from from Florida, and they all had to work together to get something done, regardless of whether they they liked the way each other looked or smelled or talked or whatever. You know, and um, so I think that's probably one of the things that the military does better than any other American institution. I, you know, other than like sports. You know what I mean? But oh, it's very agreed. very similar ethos in that way. So, um, oh, agreed. yeah, agreed. Yeah, no, and, 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 and interestingly, man, you know, that was actually my first experience to realize that not everybody really wanted to be called dude. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, right. I didn't know that dude was an insult. I didn't know that dude was an insult uh, in, in particular other parts of the co- uh, in, in other parts of the country. So that was. Mm-hmm. It. Yeah, you get. Yeah, exactly. That Well, that's what it does, man. That's what that's what traveling and meeting new people does. Period. You learn you learn. Uh, we may be speaking the same language, but meaning different things, man. So, uh, for Absolutely. sure, man. All right, man. So I got to ask about this, dude. Learning to despise white panties, man. Oh, brother, brother, brother. So, <laughs> man. So, you know, 25 years later, man, I still have this absolute disgust of white panties, man. Because, you know, going back to the teamwork thing. So first night, you know, first night in, like, basic training we you know we had shipped from reception uh we'd done all the in processing that there was to do we get to our you know we get to our company uh bravo 310 and you know as an anderson and my uh, my battle buddy um and i had the first mail shift of fire guard you know just doing the just doing the right thing everybody had laundry to do so it was kind of like hey you know guys do you mind uh we're gonna put our laundry in do you mind just swapping it putting it in the dryer when um you know, so when you guys get on for your fire guard, and then that way it'll be dry by the time we get done, and you know, it's the whole teamwork thing. Yeah, no problem. So I draw the unlucky task of emptying uh, the laundry, and I, bro, I kid you not, <laughs> like I'm not looking. I'm just grabbing stuff out of there, and I happen to pick up like a pair of white Hanes her way, and <laughs> it was like it had like this gnarly brownish green splotch. Ooh that was in there and i've been forever scarred with like white panties ever after that i threw in th- those jokers immediately in the dryer uh but uh yeah man I, even to this day i'm not a fan <laughs> not <laughs> okay. a fan so, so yeah story of the panties the, the name the, the names are uh, have been changed to protect the innocent man 25 years later <laughs> um, i appreciate that man thank no, you come on man Art, we, we don't we don't want to call anybody out man uh those, those two those two fine young ladies are probably uh are uh, doing well somewhere hopefully so uh, oh I, i'm i'm quite certain that they are they're all young uh, middle-aged upstanding citizens now there we go there we go we won't we won't tell that story to embarrass them in front of their kids um <laughs> given they so hey so uh so tell me about the gas chamber man oh man so the gas chamber so uh being in the chamber of cs for the first time was a um it was a very defining experience. Tell, tell, wait, tell, for, hold on before we go. Tell, uh, for those of us who don't know what that is, tell us real quick what that is. Oh, uh, oh, the tear gas, uh, tear gas chamber. Oh, the tear gas chamber. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. 
Yeah. So yeah, we're in the tear gas chamber. Is a you know is a, a huge rite of passage uh, for those going through basic training. As a matter of fact, I think that's the one day nobody ever gets KP. Nobody gets any of the ancillary duties. It's like everybody has to go and get uh, tear gassed, uh, ostensibly to go check your mask, uh, your you know nuclear biological chemical mask to make sure it's fitting, and uh, kind of give people you know an idea of how to work in the uh, you know the chemical environment. Um, so it, there's good there. Uh, it's also a, um, <laughs> a great opportunity for uh, drill sergeants and assorted cadre to have a great laugh at the uh, at the at the expense of the soldiers. I know this because as time went on and uh, I got I got commissioned and I was you know working at a basic training organization, <laughs> we got a chance to gas uh, the young soldiers going through, and it was all. So you good. got a chance. You got a chance to pay back your younger self, basically. Right? Oh yeah, absolutely, man. And it so was, is this? So this is very tier- enjoyable. But this uh, is. A- Real quick, real quick. So this is uh, this is like just coming out of a desert storm kind of thing, like just uh, in, in the aftermath of that, or is this about, a little bit, quite a bit later? Six years after desert. Storm. Okay, so six years after. That's right. Yep. Yes. Okay. So six years ahead. after desert. I'm sorry, what's up? No, no, no. Go ahead. I interrupted you. Go for it. No, I apologize. Yeah. So it's about six years after desert storm. Uh, certainly after uh, you know America's probably first large concern uh, as a military about chemical warfare or whatnot. Right. You can understand that that took a, a, a very large uh, precedence in the training uh, going forward um, and still plays a very, uh, very large role in the training of soldiers now. OK. Uh, but again, you know, like I said, and, you know, I think this would have been probably late February, early March of 96. I don't you know, I don't have any type of larger picture of any of this. I just know that it's pretty stinking uncomfortable uh in the gas chamber <laughs> <laughs> so um so you but, yeah so interestingly you know interestingly so the the gas chamber goes this we're lying in there say groups of 15 and right before you get in there they take they tell you it's what you're supposed to do you know walk in with your mask you know test your fitting blah 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 then you're going to lift the mask but you're not going to breathe you're not going to open your eyes not going to do any of those things. Then you put the mask on, clear and seal it, and you should be breathing again. So at that point, great part is, is that you should have just a little bit of the, the gas that's in there. So it becomes all comfortable, but not unbearable. Uh, and then the next step is that they want you to take your mask off. And then you're supposed to say your last name and the last four of your social security number. So that works out great. As an Anderson, guess who always gets to be first in line? <laughs> yeah, right. This guy, right? Uh, so I go ahead and pull the mask off. Anderson, last four of my social security number. And then it goes to my battle buddies, like blah, 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 you know, yada, yada, yada. We go all the way down the line. So we get to the C's and she won't pull her freaking mask off. Problem is, nobody can go anywhere until everybody does it and you can't put your mask back on. Ooh. So Joe Sargent's like, take your bleeping mask off. I won't take it off. So she's like, he's, and everybody's like, you know, whatever. So I start, I don't know, pop locking because, <laughs> because I'm trying to walk out of there and I'm trying to stand in the position of attention. But, you know, again, now I'm breathing, breathing tear gas and getting more uncomfortable by the moment. <laughs> so finally she, you know, gets herself together, gets her mask off. So guy goes, uh, you know, right face, you're supposed to do this kind of order. So you get a right face and you're supposed to, you know, forward march out the door. So as soon as he said her right face, I immediately start ready stepping out the door. Get back here, Anderson. Get back here. So we do this about three or four times. So now, you know, uh, somebody in the seas went from being the problem. Now it went from, you know, <laughs> Brian being the problem for everybody getting out of there. So finally got myself together, uh, you know, walked out you know we walked out as a group and of course you know uh every bit of sinus congestion that i had from the previous month and a half or whatever was now dripping down my face oh yeah yeah that's a that's a messy that's a messy trip (laughs) great times that's a messy trip man yeah no 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 doubt just uh not not your average everyday induction into a civilian job is it not at all not at all i guess unless you're you know working uh working with the police force it'll probably be about the closest equivalent uh that i can think of Um, no doubt but uh, (laughs) what uh so so you get your first so you're you're what how old are you about 19 at the time no Uh, 20 20, 21 something like that right 
Yeah, I was 20. Yeah, I was 20. 20, there we go. So you get your first week of, weekend of, of, of your, now you're in, now you, then you went to medic school. Is that right? Yes, yes. So graduate from there, uh, you know, uh, you know, graduate from basic training, you know, a couple, you know, some, whatever else, you know, the normal, normal tale from there. Go to uh, San Antonio, Texas and uh, for medic school, man. And, you know, first couple of weeks were locked down. I actually had the uh, fortune of turning 21 uh, right while I was in medic school. I want to say we were the third week of medic school when I turned 21. Uh, interesting. You know, banner, you know, certainly a banner, uh, banner birthday. Uh, great thing that I can remember from that, though, is my mom, uh, who is like, I absolutely adore, uh, had time the sending of my birthday present that I would actually get it on my actual 21st birthday. Nice. Uh, so we were sitting under the uh, we're sitting under the, the, the common troop area, we're sitting under the common troop area and, uh, you know, sitting in platoon, you know, two formation getting mail and you used to have to do, uh, used to have to do uh, push-ups for your mail. And so, uh, you know, the bigger the package was the more push-ups that you have. And the next thing I know, uh, the drill sergeant's like, Anderson, that's drill sergeant. Here's your effing package. I don't know what the hell is in here. It's, this thing is heavy. So he tosses it and all you hear is thump. Oh. You know, you know, he didn't really throw it, but he kind of tossed it at me or whatever else. And he's like, you know what you got to do? So I get down and I'll start pushing. He's like, you know, I'll do whatever. And he's like, yeah, you're going to keep pushing for a little bit. So I open it though. I got a you know very quick aside. So I open this, and my mom again, God bless her, man. My mom for my twenty first birthday had made this happy twenty first birthday sign, and had went around like all the way through the neighborhood, previous jobs that I had, people that I knew, good friends, all this other stuff, and had them and took pictures of them holding this happy twenty one. Nice, that's cool, 21st man. First birthday, yeah, man. And it was a it was a scrapbook. In addition to that, there was a scrapbook of a bunch of different you know just periods and times in my life and stuff like that man so you know 24 years later i still have this she also put a check in there for 21 dollars, which is probably the first check my parents have never cashed <laughs> 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 but uh you know so you know here to this day you know 24 some odd years later man I, you know i still have the scrapbook uh still have the check um i think i'm gonna go and mess around and cash it one of these days i'm just kidding yeah uh, right 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 but you know, it's just, uh, it was, it was just, it was just fantastic. So anyways, moving on, uh, get done with all of that. Um, then we get our first pass, first weekend pass a couple weekends, uh, a couple weekends in. Uh, so now I'm 21. My friends are like, Hey dude, we're going to go out and go get you drunk for your 21st birthday. I'm like, man, that's awesome. Downtown San Antonio back in, uh, 96 was actually an incredible place to be. Um, lots of stuff going on, lots of things to see, especially for a young male that had been, uh, uh, locked away for uh, you know several months. Yep. Uh, some of those stories, I, I don't think the uh, statute of limitation has uh, expired yet. Some no, no, we don't want to. No, no, we don't. Do you, if there's any question at all, don't say them. Don't say them. You know what you've written down. I, I've got to. You, you say what you want to say. Oh uh, yeah, no, no. So you know, it's just been. Uh, it, was, it was a great time though. Um, yeah. So we go. Yeah, downtown San Antonio, man, and uh, you know, lots of lots of great times. Uh, certainly, lots of great times there. Cool, man. Cool. Well, moving on. So you're when you get into kind of your regular job. So you were in medic school for a while. Now you've you've uh, you've popped around quite a bit as mo as a lot of people in the military do if they stay in, staying as long as you did. But um, so you you uh, so you went active duty lab tech in '98, and you were in Washington, Korea, San Antonio, Texas, Korea, South Carolina. Back to Texas, Saudi Arabia, San Antonio, Kansas, Korea, and back to Killing, Texas. So, um, you've obviously, you know, been around the block a little bit in the army. So, what what out of those kind of stick out? What were your impressions of uh, being over in Korea, uh, Saudi Arabia? You and I kind of reconnected a little bit, probably around the time you were in South in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so yeah, the biggest takeaway is I, you know. Living in Korea, you know, multiple times over the years, man, was, you know, really an eye-opening experience. I a, was very fortunate to do a lot of traveling uh, around the Pacific Rim, uh, yep. three trips there, um, you know, really just seeing the the difference in interactions again. I mean, you know, you and I have grown up around uh, a, a lot of the uh, various types, I, I guess we would say, what, uh, what Eastern, Eastern Asians, so we would talk about, uh, what, 
Uh, our friends are primarily a Chinese heritage, Japanese, and, and some Korean heritage. Yeah, Pacific Rim, and I had a we all in 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 our larger neighborhood is actually a lot. Uh, I had a few Cambodians and Vietnamese in my neighborhood. A lot of Japanese. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the Japanese have been in our part of California for going back oh, yeah. to the 1800s. Chinese as well. So yeah, definitely a heavy Pacific Rim Southeast Asian uh, presence with the kids that you and I grew up with. Oh yeah, yeah. So you know. In- was you know kind of very eye uh, it was very eye opening just to kind of see the origin of a lot of the friends that you know that I grew up with and stuff like same that. for me yeah absolutely you know so I was you know certainly some good times there uh, you know my first time I went you know I was still young a very knucklehead soldier um, you know so uh, I was working in a medical laboratory at that time um, had a lot of responsibilities even as a junior soldier which was good um, what and- kind of what were you doing kind of lab, lab tech you processing what like you dealing with <laughs> medical stuff or what. <laughs> So lab tech, I would say like this. So lab tech in a uh, at the time was you know uh, the northern portion of South Korea was pretty much the uh, where a lot of the combat troops were at. So you know, as a medical laboratory technician, they recall exactly what it was. Was doing a lot of uh, uh, STD. Uh, I was about to say, man, you're you're cleaning up <laughs> cleaning up for the bad decisions of soldiers. Yeah, pretty much a lot of STD checks, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of education uh, to my brothers, <laughs> my brothers and sisters in arms uh, about what they were supposed to be doing and. So- not supposed you, to be doing. You get a uh, couple. During, you get a couple of those. What's the matter? You burning? That kind of thing. Oh yeah, man. More than a few. Um, you know, and, and stuff like that. Uh, it was, you know, interestingly on that uh, on that note. Um, as a med lab tech, I'm just a diagnostic guy. Like, I'm not the collector. Oh, go, okay, okay. So I'm sitting in, but you know, I say that to say it. I'm sitting in my office one day, and uh, this fella comes by. Uh, we'll just call him P. He comes by and a uh, good dude, you know, fresh out of medic school and he's working in the uh, in the treatment area. And he's like, he's like, hey, man, he's like, hey, Anderson, uh, hey, uh, can you come over and help me collect this specimen? Uh, I don't know how to do it. And I said, well, hey, man, I don't collect, dude, but I'll talk you through it. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, we go in there and, you know, I, I kind of talk him through the process and, and whatever. I'll actually get I was. I was going to tell you that story, <laughs> but <laughs> that one might be a little too... Uh... Suffi- suffice to su- suffice... Hey, listen, we can say anything on this podcast, cursing it up, but I also understand... Uh, you, I think we all get the picture, man, but... Uh, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah so, man. So not, so not exactly the most glamorous part of your job there. No, not at all. Not at all. But, you know, it, it, it was certainly necessary, and uh, I, I would tell you on a more serious note, you know, given the opportunity to actually do some you know, community health training uh, and things of that nature, uh, you know, for again, you know, the brothers and sisters that were working up there, man, was an incredible honor. Uh, that was one of my earlier, you know, again, one of my earlier responsibilities was just, you know, giving presentations, talking, you know, providing awareness and things of that nature. Um, so it, it was good just to kind of be, a, you know, kind of be a party to that um, and, you know, kind of reducing the instances of, uh, of burning and certainly of, of uh, pregnancies and, uh, and things of that nature, you know, kind of while we were over there, man. So I, I was certainly in that regard, I was honored. But in between that, you know, certainly was still the young knucklehead soldier kind of getting out, uh, exploring the country. Uh, spent a lot of time in Seoul, had a really good crew uh, down there. Um, you know, I learned some valuable lessons, like you should never learn, you should never put a name <laughs> to the group of friends that you're at or that you're hanging around with because the minute that you put a name on something, you're apparently not just a group of friends, but you're now a gang. Um, oh, I see that. that yeah. That's, that's news to me, man. I, I, you, I know you as many things, Brian, that, that has never been one of them, but, but you learn something new, right? Yeah, exactly. And I definitely <laughs> learned that, uh, you know, I learned that. So, you know, uh, let's just say, I, you know, for a while I didn't leave my fighting ways, uh, back in Sacramento. Um, so we kind of carried those on forward, uh, and stuff like that. But, yeah, man. Uh, you know, I, I, I know where did where did you go? Where did you where, when you had some some leave? Where did you where did you kind of branch out out of Korea? Where did you go in Southeast Asia? Oh, uh, let's see that that trip. Uh, Sydney, Australia. Spent some time in Thailand. Uh, went to Beijing. Uh, that was very quick. I didn't like that at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> Beijing's a uh, different animal, man, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, you know, it's definitely that. Um, you know, certainly it took my. I did those, you know, primarily on my weekend passes uh, when I had the, you know, when I had the ability to uh, for long weekends. Uh, 
then obviously, you know, I get the, the big 30 day came back home to Washington state. You know, I had, uh, I had two daughters at the time and, you know, and the wife, so came home and, you know, certainly spent, you know, a good four weeks back in, back in Western Washington, uh, getting rained on most likely depending on what time of year that it was. Right. Right. Uh, stuff like that. But yeah, man, just, you know, great times. Uh, I, I think the more, I think probably the best portion of that first trip, honestly, was my friends uh, that I met. Uh, many of them I still keep in contact now. Um, you know, with we're still very close to this day. You know, well over 20 years later, uh, really good. You know, I was in a medical unit, and there was only I think at our post was only maybe 30, 35 of us, and we all lived basically on the same floor of the same building. So, you know, you get a chance to really bond and forge a lot of really lifelong relationships. Yep. Um, you know, certainly born over a lot of alcohol, a lot of beer, uh, and certainly over a lot of travel uh, around the country as well. Did you uh, did you kind of get a flavor? Was was you know obviously the North Korea South Korea thing has been you know going on at, at a slow burn since the end of the war, but did, you know it flares up in different times. Or sometimes there's protest over there, uh, sometimes not. But what did uh, was your impression? Because South Korea is a pretty impressive place from, you know, as far as, my, as far as I'm concerned. And it's just, a, it's, an, it's a really interesting place because it's just right up against one of the, you know, one of the hot spots of the world. It's at the 38th parallel over, I think, something like that. But oh, yeah. what would your, did you see anything over there? Was, uh, you know, what were your impressions of that? Well, so I, to, to, to begin that, I would say that the South Korea of today is far different than what it was in, you know, uh, back in 2000. Um, Korea is a country that I absolutely love. I, I'll say that first. I absolutely yeah. Do. Because you just went back there eighteen nineteen, right? So you went there first in two thousand, and then uh, you were back there in two thousand eighteen nineteen. Yeah, well, actually, that was my, that was my third trip. So I was there. Okay, two thousand one. My second trip was uh, what was that eight two thousand eight two thousand nine. Oh yeah, two thousand eight two thousand nine. Yeah, right. And then again uh, eighteen to nineteen. So really, just one. Just to kind of preface it by saying, you know, it's just such a profound difference. Uh, in the country, uh, you know, it, it's grown so much over the years. Um, it's changed so much over the years. Uh, but my first impression, man, you know, really my first kind of learning or knowledge base into the, you know, kind of like the dynamic between uh, the North and the South, uh, one was certainly from being stationed there, but I also had read a book uh, from Pusan to Penmun John, which was the, by the first uh, rock uh, chief of staff. And uh, uh, it was a very enlightening book. Um, interestingly enough that, you know, where I was posted, uh, was right down one of the main thoroughfares that the, uh, DPRK would actually take to, you know, attack into South Korea. So, you know, it's really eye opening, uh, really just to see that, you know, if the bell actually rang for real, uh, that, you know, within a, a span of time that, you know, you could potentially see, you know, North Korean soldiers would be coming right down that thoroughfare as their access of advance. So right. very, very eye opening. Uh, it, it puts a lot of things into perspective that it is not just fun and, and soju and food and, and bar girls. But right. It's indeed a, a real thing that's going on. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's a, and it's an interesting experience for you to be able to you kind of you kind of get a 10 year uh, like a decade snapshot. So you 2000. 2008, nine, and then again in uh, you know almost in 2020. So that's kind of a kind of interesting snapshot that not a lot of people get to get visited in regular intervals over that 20 year period, basically. So uh, yeah, really interesting. I was curious about that. Did you now? Did you uh, get to the Middle East at all? Uh, I did. Outside of Saudi Arabia, I'm sorry. Did you get to Afghanistan, Iraq at all? Uh, I hit Iraq. Uh, I hit Iraq once. Um, I wasn't ducking. <laughs> yeah, right. I just, you know, interestingly, I had a, I had a trip to Iraq uh, during the earlier phases of the war. Um, you know, it was, a, it was it was just an experience. I, I I don't have any great war stories to be honest with you. No, uh, no, no. That's not it. Yeah, just curious if you made it through there at some point. You know. Yeah. No. 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 So no. 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 I mean, this is you know. Again, I went. Uh, I went as a, a med lab tech. So again, my you know my my thing was there for, was mainly helping and treating and making sure that we were getting those war fighters. You know getting the warfighters healthy and getting them back to the front, you know, and make sure that they were able to do what they needed to do. Uh, I was had one other trip to uh, Afghanistan that was supposed to happen when I went to uh, Killeen back in 13. Well, I'm sorry, back in 10, um, but got caught up uh, with another issue and ended up being uh, left behind. Uh, okay. You know, all things work out for a reason, I guess. That's right. 
And um, your your Saudi, you know, your time in Saudi, you was you uh, you mentioned you were an advisor to the Saudi army. Was that in a medical capacity, or what? Like, what was uh, what was that for? So, just a, a quick aside. So, an adjustment to my, you know, kind of a, on my timeline. So, uh, the earlier portion of my career was spent as a medic. Um, I did go to uh, officer candidate school back in 2007 and got recommissioned as a quartermaster officer, supply guy. Okay. Um, so. You know, pretty much anything after the 2007, uh, it's all as a logistician uh, supply guy. Um, so my trip to Saudi, I was actually a logistics advisor okay. uh, to them. Uh, and it was that was a great, great tour. Um, probably, I would say this, Saudi Arabia could have been my best tour had it not been for our team leader who... Uh, Man, I you know I was gotta keep the uh, keep the expletives to a minimum, but I, I will have to say is why the team leader was just a consummate ass. Well, that's that. Be, I'll 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 pop in real quick with that because that's something I always want to touch on with each each time I talk to because obviously, uh, uh, you know, leadership is a seeing good leadership and bad leadership, and then the the, the process of lear, you know learning from that leadership and helping you shape who you are as a as an officer too, man. Right, so you get really good good leadership and really good bad bad leadership and it sounds like that was the experience of, of really poor leadership and but that can also be sometimes just as valuable if not more valuable of letting you know giving you a full front and right in your right in your face example of what you don't want to do right this is true this is true and especially under ordinary circumstances uh what made this one probably even worse i would say uh was that i was on a very small team uh and it was you know a very non-traditional army posting so it was only us uh, and, you know, it's kind of made worse by like everything else. You have a bad boss at your job. You know, what you get a chance to do is you get a chance to go home at the end of the day and hang out with your friends, your family, your loved ones and everything. Uh, this one, you know, it was 10 of us. And yeah, bad boss lives right across the street. And yeah. bad boss every day for work. You can see bad boss in the evenings, you know, and it's just one of those things. So it just was. That can grind on you, man. Oh my goodness, man! It was it was pretty rough. I'm be honest with you, man. There were some some rough times over there, and I've never, you know, just a. Interestingly enough, I've never really have had like a, a really bad posting, and I've never really have had times which I didn't want to like, uh, go to work or do do any of those types of things. And I was actually feeling like that a few times uh, in Saudi Arabia, which again, interestingly, man, because that that was. A beautiful assignment, man. I worked three hours a day. You know, I worked three or four hours a day with the Saudis. Uh, I spent the rest of my time in, you know, shorts and flip flops. You know, getting things prepared for them or uh, stuff like that. You know, kind of looking into things and you know preparing training and and, and, and stuff like that. But you know, what should have been what should have been fantastic and you know should have had me chomping in a bit to do a, a second year there. Was had me looking out the door for the earliest opportunity to to get out. On a crazy note, though, real quick, on a crazy note. You were in Riyadh, man. Sorry, you were in Riyadh? Uh, no, I was actually north of Riyadh. I was in a town, uh, the northwest uh, area of uh, Saudi Arabia. I was in a town called Tabuk. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to get see where, just to get established where you were. So, yeah, go ahead. You said, go ahead. Crazy town. Yeah. Oh, I said, so interestingly enough, I get through all of that, bad boss and all, and that actually gave me a really good evaluation. <laughs> so, well, damn, okay. I, you know, I... You know, it's just, again, you know, the blessings, the, the blessings, they rain, man. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, what, uh, so what was, you, you said you enjoyed your time in Saudi. Were you pretty much, did you do some traveling at all there, or were you pretty much confined to your base or your work area or what? So, no. Uh, so, I, I always describe Saudi Arabia as uh, the movie Escape from New York. Uh, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, be, for, be, for the be Pliskin over here, man, or what? <laughs> exactly, man. <laughs> Minus the eye patch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minus the eye patch. Either that, or I was like the Duke of the Duke of New York, man. So, <laughs> so um, but anyways, uh, you know, the uh, we had pretty much free reign to kind of travel around the town itself. Um, but for those of the for those who maybe maybe listening or whatnot that don't know much about Saudi Arabia. You know, it's a little bit different than uh, most places in the West and a lot of places in, you know, anywhere else in which, you know, very conservative country. Um, there's no clubs, there's no bars, there's certainly no drinking, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and there's no, none of the typical like male-female interaction uh, that you would have, 
you know, almost anywhere else in the world. So, you know, us going out, you know, us going out, you know, consists of myself, my roommate, uh, and one of my interpreters, really good dude, uh, an Egyptian guy, man. And, uh, uh, you know, we go out, go have dinner on uh, stuff like that, you know, go talk. I learned a lot, you know, it was a, it was a great opportunity to learn a lot about another culture, uh, especially one that, uh, you know, at sometimes can seem so antagonistic, so alien or so foreign. Yeah. Um, but really just having a great opportunity just to kind of interact close up. Um, so that was, you know, kind of the time inside the kingdom. Yeah. Uh, we would make a trip, occasional trips down to Riyadh because we could drink on the uh, main compound. So those were great opportunities just to kind of, you know, get down there, get a little alcohol, kind of unwind a little bit, you know, right. that kind of thing. Uh, and then, uh, again, you know, the good with the bad. Truth and lending. Uh, my team leader was really good about allowing us the time to kind of get out of the country and uh, and go explore. Uh, my roommate and I went and ran a uh, half marathon and uh, I did a 10K uh, in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, you know, some great times there. Uh, had a chance, to, a couple chances to go over to uh, to Qatar, to Doha to hang out. I had a good friend of mine, uh, an old neighbor uh, from my first trip to Colleen. Uh, she was over there as an educator. Uh, an English teacher, and uh, we had a chance to kind of go and go hang out with her and her friends, and just kind of unwind for a little bit, go see concerts and things of that nature. Right. So we had, had a lot of opportunities to kind of travel while we were, you know, in that area there. Uh, caught up with a, uh, tried to catch up with another friend of ours from the neighborhood that was teaching English over in Abu Dhabi, man. But oh, really? Uh, yeah, uh, another Nick, and uh, you know that was teaching English over there, but we just never really could connect the time. Oh, yeah, Nick. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, yeah. Wonder, yeah, yeah. Wonder where he's at. Really What's that? I said, yeah, I was, I, I caught up with him for a, for, for a quick second and then, uh, and then lost touch again. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's just one of those things, but yeah, man, uh, you know, certainly, you know, certainly very enlightening, uh, another very enlightening, uh, experience, uh, you know, so you let me ask you, let me talk. ask you this real quick, man. What is, so your impressions of obviously, you know, uh, like anywhere, Saudi Arabia is not the same as uh, I've been to the Gulf and a few places through the Gulf as well. But um, what was your what were your impressions going over and how did they change kind of, uh, you know, after your year there? Oh, man, if any, if any. So interestingly, um, I'm not sure the impressions change so much. It's just a uh, deeper understanding of the people. Right. Um, and, and stuff. So, you know, part of my job was dealing with, you know, was really just kind of being the face of. America, for lack of a better term, uh, right. north, you know, Northwest to book. Um, and, uh, or I'm sorry, Northwest Saudi Arabia. And, uh, so as a part of that was the interaction between like myself and my, you know, my Saudi counterparts. Well, you know, the army is constructed similarly. Um, it's constructed very similarly. Um, and certainly with the equivalents in rank, uh, and things of that nature. But I found myself really interacting with a lot of senior, Saudi officers uh, on a very regular basis, um, you know, and it was it was incredible because I learned a lot about them on a personal level, learned about their families, um, you know, the things that they like, the things that they were into, uh, some of their hobbies, got invited to their houses to have dinners, uh, things of that nature. And, you know, if you've never had a dinner over there, man, it is it's an incredible affair. But brother, the whole production, huh? Like, Brother, like you, like don't go over there hungry because you're gonna be waiting for a while for the, you know, <laughs> preparation. So you kind of have to have a meal before the meal, um, <laughs> you know. But 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 really great to just interact with them on, you know, on that level, man. No, those are incredible experiences, though, man. And I'm, I'm, you know, that I think you know you and I've talked multiple times off air about the the uh, the kind of divide. I would say goal for divide between people who have, have have had a chance to do some international travel and 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 then more importantly not just visiting but living with living places and kind of really getting to know places uh as as much as as a as a foreigner can man and and kind of those who haven't man and it really is it really is a, a great you know i wouldn't i'm I, I know you'll agree with this man because i've talked to you about this before but i wouldn't trade any of those experiences for the world man because it just it brought i think i feel like it broadens my just broadens my understanding of a bit more of the world so much more you know oh, it, does. And it certainly puts a lot of things uh, into perspective uh all the conversations that you and i have had you know about the importance of that world perspective when dealing with you know local news or events or things that are kind of shaped you know kind of transpiring around us currently you know no question no question putting things into perspective for sure man and then you know kind of like 
I kind of want to get into, you know, that's your, so you're, that takes you, that takes you now to where you are, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned all this in the introduction, but uh, to you before we started recording, but that takes you to now you're now you're kind of on your way out of the service at this point. Is that right? I am. I am. So I've got about another four days. Yeah, I've got about another four days in the army. Uh, Damn. Okay. I, so we're really we're recording this right at the end. Yeah, man. And that's you know, it, it, to be honest, that's part of the reason why we kind of postponed this a little bit because I, you know, like we had talked, I, I needed to kind of take a moment to kind of put my arms around the whole thing. You know, right. it's, uh, it's been a, it's been a wonderful trip. Uh, I've been very very fortunate. The army's done you know great by me and, the, and my family. It's taken a lot. Uh, but you know, it certainly has been a very, very enjoyable trip. And while I'm ready to go, <laughs> yeah, right, I hear you. you. Know, while I'm ready to go, you know, really just the uh, kind of the flood of of emotions to a non-emotional person such as myself was right. kind of enough that you know I kind of had to take a moment, and kind of put it all in, put it all back in its box real quick before we can kind of talk about it. Well, what and and yeah, that's kind of that's where I want to kind of take it. You know, given the you're you're, you're headed towards the end, man. Like what? did you you know going into the service did you have expectations or ideas of what it was going to be about and how kind of how is that you know how's that changed over a career man like what are your what are your impressions what does the army do well what does it not do well um whatever you're comfortable talking about but kind of what are your what are your general impressions of your time in the service obviously you're grateful to do it but uh general impressions obviously is it, it's been great i mean you know uh so looping kind of back to what we were talking about a little earlier you know we're not doing man you know, I really joined. I really joined to like learn something. You know, to be able to provide for my family. That was really what it was. The important, you know, the, the important thing for me was. Um, so while I certainly missed out on a lot of like the fun opportunities, you know, jumping out airplanes, jumping out helicopters, and, and, and things of that nature, um, I really wanted to take kind of take the army as an opportunity to really you know position myself uh, to secure my family's way forward. Um, yep. So in that regard, man. Uh, I, I certainly have accomplished that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and to have a career, yeah, you, and you don't, yeah, and your I new certainly career. accomplished that, man. Uh, with the you know this next gig, but you know, I, I I would say the understanding of it has changed a lot over the years. I mean, and obviously because you know when you first start off, you know you're let's call it what it is, man, a, a private or whatever the equivalent is in the other branches of service, you know, specifically the Navy and the Air Force. Uh, as the Marines have a, a very similar rank structure, but as a very junior, you know, as a very junior soldier, man, you're a basic labor unit, man. And so you don't really, <laughs> you don't really have any oversight. That's a good way of putting it, a basic labor unit. <laughs> yeah, you don't have any oversight. You don't have any overview of anything. You know, what you're in charge of is the mop that they put in front of you, <laughs> the, yeah, right. the buffer that they put in front of you, or the M16 that they put in front of you. That's what you're in charge of and not much else. Um, right. But... What I would say is, you know, just with the uh, mastering those, you know, those things that were in front of me uh, and a lot, you know, had opened up the door to more responsibility and things of that nature. And the more I started to see was the more I started to appreciate uh, the seemingly mundane and stupid things that I had to do uh, when I was a young soldier. It kind of started, you know, kind of started enlightening me on the reasons and uh, the methods behind the madness, I guess, for better, lack of a better term. Right, right. And then, you know, one thing one thing you mentioned that I kind of wanted to touch on that was interesting. You said because you always, you know, like me, man, you've always I, I call you I call you really just a contrarian, kind of similar to me. Right. Like you just you kind of always want to dig a little deeper than a surface surface answer. And you're not um, you know, you've never been afraid to, to just, you know, go your own way and, uh, you know, march to the beat of your own drummer type, whatever cliche you want to apply. But that's you know, that kind of spirit is one of the, I think one of the reasons that you know, first drew me to you as a friend, you know what I mean? So what, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, you, you, that being the case, you, you go into a, to a, to a, to a career, which is rigidly structured in some areas, but also, you know, as you go through, it trains you to be more, to, to give you more and more responsibility as well. So kind of what you've bristled at authority, that type of thing. Um, you had a problem with that. How, how has that changed over the time too? So I still bristle at authority. <laughs> <laughs> no question. So, but you know, I, I but you know, part of parts of those things have changed. One because you know I've, I've worked to put myself uh, in a position of authority, so I don't have to answer to too many people now, right? Uh, and, and things of that nature. So that was always good. Earlier on, though, man, you know, really what it was, uh, my dad really prepared me for this because you know my dad was you know solid Midwest guy. Uh, yep, and, Mr. Anderson you know, was in school. 
yes, old school did not put up with a lot of guff. Sure um, didn't. I had to learn, you know, I learned really young to uh, kind of take my moments, you know, and pick my, you know, really either when to a challenge or when to ask questions. Uh, I kind of transitioned that into the Army, which, you know, most people that I've encountered, to be honest with you, are not <clears throat> such my way or the highway people. It's just that you have to know when, where, and how to ask the you know questions about things that are going on. Yep. And quite frankly, man, sometimes you just got to know when to shut up in color. So right, right, right. right. <laughs> so That's I've you know, I've, I've, yeah, so I've learned you know, I've learned those uh, you know I've kind of learned those lessons well uh, earlier on. Um, but the other way that you know, to be quite frank with you, man, the reason uh, the way that you get more latitude is by knowing what your job is and just being legitimately the best or among the best at whatever position that you're at, you know, and people see that they recognize that and they respect that and they will give you the latitude to kind of voice your opinion, and allow you to sit at the table. So that was, you know, that was probably one of the more important lessons that I'd learned over the years. Yeah. And to leave you alone and let you do your job. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you have to show competence and able to, you know, and able to, or in order to kind of get that, uh, that ability or that latitude uh, from your, you know, senior officers or senior non-commissioned officers as it were. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. Well, man, how's uh? So before we get on out of here, man, what's the uh, what's the uh, what's the army talking about now with 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 COVID and you know Wuhan flu and all that stuff? What is uh? Have you have you been involved in any of the logistical part of that, or how has that affected you at all, or anything like that? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question, please? No, just just you know with 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 COVID and and the coronavirus, that thing has that. Has that affected you in any way? Have, has, has it been locked down, and or are you just kind of on your way out at this point? It doesn't really affect you. How the? How that- uh, I'm on, I'm on my way out at this point, man. So I, I'm leaving this to the younger guys who are still trying to go in and get promoted. Um, you know, the great thing was I'll uh, take it take an opportunity to plug uh, <laughs> something real quick. Was, yeah, yeah, go for it, man. Uh, uh, was certainly a uh, a program that I've been involved in since January, kind of predating the whole COVID nonsense. Uh, and that allowed me to actually get out uh, and start working in corporate America, man. So, you know, while I'm still in, I haven't worn I haven't worn a uniform since January 9th of uh, of this year. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I have really just been able to kind of focus on you know a very successful transition uh, from the military to civilian life. Um, no, that's important. What's and that's important, man, because you know that. Uh, a lot of people that's you, you hear about that a lot right the transition how what 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 do you know what do soldiers do after after they're done man so that's it's 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 good that a, that there's you have a success story with the with the pro- transition program yeah oh yeah 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 no and, and that's a big help and you know certainly a far cry than what it was when i first joined man you know to be honest with you i remember uh way back you know a lot of the guys were retiring and you know we're talking about guys with 20 plus years of good practical experience smart guys uh, in a certain field and they were, you know, transitioning out and getting jobs, you know, 10, 15, you know, 10, 15, $18 an hour. These guys are working hourly. Wow. Just because the, the transition pipeline wasn't as robust as it is now. Um, and, uh, you know, as the years go by, you know, the army had started seeing, or the army started seeing that this was a problem because let's call it what it is, man. I mean, every portion of this game is, is about recruiting retention and then ultimately, you know, recruiting some more. So it just becomes like a, becomes like kind of like a, a never ending cycle, but you know, like, ba- like seeing, basketball coaching, man. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And you know, I guess the, the thing is, man, if you know, the army started realizing that, you know, it's hard to sell the army if people are getting out and they're kind of working the same BS job that they could have got without having to, you know, get your body beaten up and, 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 Apple and, and be, be away, away from, from your family friends. and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, you know, they really took that serious. Uh, part of that was the, you know, coordinating with the, the Chamber of Commerce and, uh, and and a bunch of other, you know, organizations or whatnot to really kind of enhance the uh, transition experience for soldiers, man. So I've been really fortunate uh, to come along in that timeline uh, to be able to take advantage of that. Cool, man. Cool. Well, listen, man, I, I appreciate the time. Before we get on out of here, man, you want to – you want to uh, say hello to anybody, man, that that uh, helped you along the way in the Army, man, or anything like that? Yeah, actually, I'm going to say thanks to two people. Uh, I'm, I'll give their full names because it's you know it's, it's great. First is Captain Amy O'Hare, uh, who was uh, one of my company commanders as a uh, 
uh, as a young Joe uh, at Fort Sam Houston, uh, had definitely looked the other way when I did something really knucklehead. Um, <laughs> and I should say, uh, you know, I got I got punished, but it certainly wasn't the career under that it could have possibly have been. Uh, it certainly enabled me to get to the position where I'm at right now. Uh, and Lieutenant Colonel Jeremiah Pope uh, was a guy I've had a, a very, very blessed with uh, to, to serve with twice, uh, once. After I came back from Saudi Arabia, uh, to be honest with you, he was the commander that um, kind of allowed me, not to allow me to stay in the army still, but whose professionalism really made my desire come back to stay in the army. Was nice, nice. Saudi trip, that was rough. And uh, and then I had an opportunity to work for him again, my last trip in Korea as his, uh, as his battalion executive officer. Um, hands down, the finest commander that I've ever worked under. Uh, and one of the finest human beings I've ever met. So nice. two people, uh, and then, you know, the remainder of it is just, you know, good friends, like I said, I've met along the way, um, you know, and, and I take the bad, I've learned some, I've learned some from the bad, but I've learned a whole heck of a lot more from the good. Yeah. Nice, man. Well, that's a perfect way to end it, man. B, it's, uh, it's been, super, you know, pleasure, man. Awesome. And again, Dan, thank you for, uh, for, for sharing your story and also for introducing me to, to quite a few other other people who choose your line of work, man, and I'm and I hope to just kind of continue this rolling, man. But I wanted to, definitely wanted to get your get you get your show done too, man, because I just was because uh, of you know our connection, man. So um, I, you know, I really appreciate that, man. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, I mean, it's a pleasure and, and, and an honor, man. I'm glad to be a part of uh, what you're doing here, man. I think it's something special. Cool, cool. Well, before we get out of here, man, uh, anybody listening, please follow us, uh, Apple iTunes, subscribe to this podcast, Apple iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, um, iHeartRadio, all of your, uh, anywhere you can find podcasts, we'll, we'll, we'll be there and uh, write a review, hopefully glowingly positive, please, and uh, and uh, share the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate it. And if you know anybody that's got some compelling stories to sell uh, to tell, please uh, contact Contact me and we'll we'll figure something out. But uh, with that said, B, let's uh, hopefully we get you out to SoCal sometime, man, and uh, and a visit when this all when this when this this nonsense all dies down, man. Oh yeah, absolutely, man. I was just waiting for uh, Newsom to go and open it back up, brother. <laughs> yeah, we might be waiting, huh? <laughs> we waiting a while, right? <laughs> all right, brother. Good talking to you. Talk to you down the line, man. Right, Nick, take care. Bye, Later, now. brother.